Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to get all this stuff. This is the first time I'm. So you guys only see it on this one, huh? Um, how can we change the monitor? Let's see here. Is this the kind that bothers you? It'll like. No, this one's probably going to save me. I see. Okay, good. And well, we got a long time, huh? Good to see a lot of you back in here and some new faces as well. Very nice. You guys will definitely be with my next experts after you study this whole book, right? It'll give you the foundation you need to do advanced study. So I'm excited that a lot of you stuck around. This semester was going to be a lot more, some more, uh, we'll, we'll look at wave guides, which is going to be something probably a little bit more familiar classical. But we're going to get into some numerical algorithms deep into geometrical optics. In geometrical theory of fraction, differential geometry, a high frequency asymptotic solution for a wave equation, and we'll, we'll derive and solve some pretty interesting differential equations governing um, electromagnetic pro wave propagation to inhomogeneous media. If you remember last semester, maybe I should wait till everybody gets here. Part of yeah, I'm just excited about what you guys are learn this semester. So, <laughs> rambling. All right, what uh, I think we're missing. I need to make sure that the does anybody have their laptop? Can you go to the Canvas website and see if the Zoom link is working? Uh, it seems to be shh. Let me see what I'm doing. Can you see and hear us? Um, the Zoom link is office hours. No, not that one. The one below it. Yeah, I think it's working. It's asking for uh, entering meeting and should I join it? Yeah, just to see if I see your participant. Someone popped up here. Okay, good. Uh, the other thing is, can you, you can see me well when I'm above or in front of here? Do you see it as a little screen in the upper right corner? Uh, Okay, that, that's exactly how it worked before. All right, good. So we need to mute. Okay, yeah, because since you're on the Zoom. So, all right, yeah, go ahead and cancel that. And hopefully it's recording, which they always say it is. Yeah, it's recording. Great. We are set up. Nice. Glad to see you in here too after you are. <laughs> All right, we'll have another it starts at four, yeah? Four. Yeah. Yeah, the conference was awesome. It was cool. That's a smaller conference. There was a lot of nice. lot, but there are more radio science people there. It's like the biggest radio science one. Yeah. Uh freezing cold. Like minus 10 degrees out there. I mean, for UNC, it's probably no big deal because you see was from New York or from Michigan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. And then all of this out here is kind of not bad. But it was, it was bad for travel because planes were getting delayed left and right and canceled. Be lucky to make it home, you know? 
was uh, interested in the uh, topics you presented? There were there were a couple of people from UCT Boulder that were interested. There was someone had a comment about yeah, with the nose, the yeah, antenna kind of nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about that. And then um, they were also mentioning. I mentioned the subreflector implementation, which you're working on, right? Yeah. That that's that'd be a good one to know because they were asking if it could be smaller. Because there is a lot of reconfiguration to do around the main reflectors rim, yeah. that would require a lot more uh, elements than simple make my work any harder than it has to be. Four laws in sense like it's like here's the green nose of like a file hits you. Oh, oh file. No, not, not like a vegan file, like a file. Like, flower. Yeah. Like when you went for it, like it hits you a lot. Yeah, like cardamom, things like that. Oh my god. It's up to C here. Mm -hmm. It's more Peter. Maybe you eat like. You also got black coffee with them too cheap. That's the word. Which group is small? Why is it bigger on the inside? No. I took the um, the radars class uh, fifty six thirty six. I'm not sure. Oh, I have you guys have to be sure. Um, no, no, no. This is events. This is a uh, radar signal class. Oh. It's okay. I think it's very easy. Um, it's mostly like applying the RCS radar cross section. It's 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 it's, it's not difficult. Um, Dr. Milley is teaching teaches it, so it's it's only taught in spring. So. Okay. Can I take radar? If he lets me. Do you let me take radars? I don't see why not. Thanks, 
How's it going, man? Good to see you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. It's four o'clock. So welcome to ECE 5106. Being in this class, that means you have the prerequisite, which is ECE 5105, meaning that you've studied. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what we covered in 5105. There are a couple of videos you can refer to if you need to catch up, if you're, if you're not from the uh, last sequence, from last semester. But uh, in here, we're going to continue on with our study of our book, which is the Advanced Engineering Electromagnetics by uh, Constantine Bolanis. And uh, by the end of this course, we will have studied all chapters of that book. And I've also interleaved a lot of my own topics that I picked up during my research uh, that will uh, help you to solve more complex electromagnetics problems. All right? So this class has got a hybrid component. I think there are some people from Northern Virginia that are also able to join us through the uh, Zoom. So there is a Zoom link for the course. Uh, first thing we'll do is we'll go over the syllabus and then I'll kind of get into what we expect to study this semester in this course and then um, we'll launch right into the first lecture, all right? So we're not going to have an electromagnetics review, which is typically done at the beginning of a new electromagnetics course because this is a part two of a class that we've already taught all the fundamentals in. So I'll, I'll kind of go through quickly what's expected of you to know in order to continue on with this course, right? Um, okay. So let's start off with the syllabus. This is 5106, it's EM waves two. And uh, I'm Jordan Badu. And uh, we have here, the lectures are gonna be Monday, Wednesday, four to 5.15 in here, you already know that. Um, the office hours are just before the class on Monday for an hour, 2.45 to 3.45 to give us enough time to come down here at, at be down here by four. And they're in my office in 472, all right? Which is on the fourth floor of this building. Um, here's a link if you want to join via Zoom. I also open up the Zoom link during the office hours and can field questions via the uh, online uh, modality. Okay, the lecture recordings will always be on Canvas in this thing called the course gallery. They're all recorded, they're uploaded here in the course gallery, so you can refer to them later when you study or if you um, just want to, to rewatch the lecture. The link for the live class Zoom is here and the password is there or the Zoom meeting number is there as well. All right, but I prefer you guys are in class, right? We get better interaction that way. And um, this is probably a record year, right? There's never been this many in 5106 as far as I know. So I'm really excited to, to uh, teach this class and I think you guys are going to, to pick up some of that excitement as well. Um, hopefully if you start to, if you see we're hitting the gas pedal right at the beginning and you want some uh, reference material, if you're coming in like maybe a year off of studying EM or something, let me know, I can set up some stuff for you guys to look at. All right, we're gonna start out slow anyway because uh, this is gonna be a fun lecture or a fun semester because we're studying, uh, we're gonna do waveguides, which is part of the book that we skipped in the first class. But then we're getting to some interesting numerical methods, method of moments, we're gonna solve integral equations and we're going to look at geometrical theory of diffraction, GTD, geometrical optics. And we're gonna solve uh, Maxwell's equations, the wave equation and what's called the high frequency asymptotic limit uh, for larger structures in terms of wavelengths. And we're going to study differential geometry in the course of doing that. So we're going to become experts in differential geometry, which is super fun and useful. Uh, okay, we're going to study dyadics. Well, I guess we can get into the syllabus here. Let's do that. All right, so we've already said all of this. So the course description here is EM fields in the presence of inhomogeneous media. We can use ray tracing or geometrical optics to study wave propagation through inhomogeneous media. In 5105, we studied periodic wave propagation in periodic media, in anisotropic media, and sort of a 
infinite, inf infinite homogeneous media with discontinuities, but we did not study inhomogeneous, continuously inhomogeneous media. And that requires us to use uh, these ray tracing techniques which we're gonna learn in this course. Separation of variables, I don't know why it says that. This is from directly in the uh, course catalogs, but we already did that last semester, right? And waveguide, cavity, radiation, scattering, we're gonna do that. And numerical methods, we're gonna do that too. Numerical methods are super useful, right? We studied last semester how to calculate the radiated electric and magnetic field due to any arbitrary current distribution, J, right, or M. If I have J or M in any distribution in space, I can calculate E and H everywhere. So the problem has been reduced to finding what J and M is, right? And in antenna courses, you approximate J and M based on some kind of educated guesses, or you can use numerical methods, the one we're going to learn in this semester, how to get exactly what J and M should be. We also learned last semester physical optics, right? That's another way to approximate J. Knowing the incident magnetic field, you can do 2N cross HI that we studied last semester. That's another way to get J. Once you have J and M or J and or M, then you can calculate E and H easily and you solve the problem. So uh, we're going to learn a technique which is much more useful. I, I don't want to say much more useful. As a matter of fact, physical optics is very useful, uh, which is much more accurate, right? To get the exact current distribution by solving the integral equation that we use to calculate the radiated fields for an unknown J called an integral equation. Um, so, you know, when you solve a differential equation, you have an equation which relates the derivatives of a function, uh, relates to the various derivatives of the function. And you solve for that function, which gives you that derivative relationship everywhere in space, right? Integral equation, oh, this better not happen all the time here. Integral equation is the same thing. You have an, an equation which relates the integrals of different functions. You need to solve that for the function that satisfies that integral relationship. But anyway, we'll get to that. So, uh, yeah, those are some of the topics. And, okay, here's a uh, why take this course. You guys can read through this, the learning objectives. And, all right, so let's get to the uh, book for the course is Advanced Engineering Electromagnetics. It's an excellent book. It's the one I studied. There are a few different choices for teaching these classes. One is Balanus's Advanced Engineering Electromagnetics, the one I used. There's Harrington's Time Harmonic Electromagnetic Fields. There's another book by Kamal Sarabandi, who he just uh, provides that book for free and just published it from the University of Michigan. And that's also supplemental text, if you want. It has a lot of the similar information, this advanced, uh, you know, electromagnetic theory. Uh, but, but there are many other texts, right? Uh, homework, there will be six homeworks. If you take in 5105, then you know the homeworks are somewhat challenging, but they're rewarding, right? You need to sit down and work through this, this material in order to really grasp it. If you just passively watch the lectures, you might understand it until it takes time to go apply it or explain it to somebody else. At that point, you start thinking, oh, maybe I need to, to really understand what I'm about to say, right? Uh, so there's six homeworks. I might cut that to five. I think there was a bit much last semester, but you guys endured and you were, we were rewarded. I, I guarantee you probably will uh, appreciate that later. So we'll see. Uh, the one thing about this course, okay, there are two tests, midterm one and exam one or final exam. So you have a midterm and a final. The midterm's Wednesday, March 13th, and the final is Friday, May 3rd, uh, 2024. The grading is weighted average of homework, midterm, and final. And there's a grading rubric here, the standard, and the final grade rubric. Uh, okay, so all throughout the course, I say I don't curve the course, so don't expect to curve, right? You know exactly what grade you have throughout the course because you can tally up all your points, all right? Uh, so the course is based on straight points. There is an extra credit assignment if you bomb an exam or something that you can do in order to get some extra points. And that's also a benefit, right? Uh, so don't worry if you fail something and you're calculating your grade and it's you know, coming out not what you expect. There are ways to improve it. And um, implicitly, I also, I don't even want to say that. I don't want you to rely on anything at the end of the semester. All right? But uh, if the average is not where I want it to be, I'm gonna probably shift everything up, so. But anyway, no curve, don't expect. All right, there's a midterm instructor review. I give this to you guys in order for, to collect feedback. So halfway through the course, I'm able to adjust the course based on your feedback and change the second half of it so that, that you guys are happier. If there's too much homework or you know not enough time for this, not enough time for that, or slow down or, or more exam, whatever it is, right? You write that up in your midterm instructor review, which they don't do here, but it's something I've set up. Then I can make adjustments for the second half of the course. 
And if you, saw, if you complete that, you get an extra 3% on your midterm grade. So if you get 97, then I add the three just for answering a couple of questions and you get 100, right? So uh, you can't go over 100, you won't get 103, but you can get three extra percent. The honor code, you guys should read that. ADA accommodations, if anybody has that, let me know and we'll take care of that. Some copyright for these notes, don't distribute them. And here are the topics, okay. So let me just jump over here to here. This is the book, the table of contents, right? So this is a good place to check whether you have the prerequisites for the course. We studied chapter one already, which is just introducing Maxwell equations, went through power and energy and all the, the classical uh, boundary conditions and so forth. Then we went deep into the electrical properties of matter. What is permittivity? What is permeability? What is its origin? What is D arise? Where does H arise? What do these vector fields represent? How do they incorporate materials? What are the constitutive relations and what are their physical origins, right? Then we looked at the wave equation. We did this in various coordinate systems. We did a rectangular first, then we did cylindrical, separated variables and cylindrical coordinates. We had special functions, Bessel functions, ensure that you have seen those before. Hankel functions, ensure that you've seen those before and you understand their properties and how to utilize them to solve scattering problems with cylindrical or uh, in this case, cylindrical symmetries. Then we did it also in spherical coordinates. We got spherical Bessel, spherical Hankel, Legendre polynomials. Make sure you've heard those words before and um, how to utilize those to solve scattering problems in spherical coordinates. Uh, there, are, there are resources. There are, all the lectures were recorded last semester and they're available if you guys want to look back at them. But don't, I'm not trying to scare you. If you guys have heard the vocabulary, you're probably okay. All right, I'll walk you through everything. All right. Uh, and then we also solved it in generalized coordinates, allowing us to separate variables in any coordinate system that's curvilinear and orthogonal. We looked at wave propagation polarization. I'm sure you've seen this, right? What are the properties of electromagnetic waves in unbounded homogeneous media? They have wave impedance, they have wave numbers, attenuation constants, polarization, state could be elliptical, circular, linear, different, uh, different states of polarization. We looked at wave propagation in lossy media and infinite unbounded homogeneous media. Then we introduced a discontinuity in that infinite unbounded homogeneous media. So now we have an infinite interface between two, se two semi-infinite homogeneous media. And we looked at what happens there, reflection, transmission. We derived reflection coefficients, transmission coefficients. We looked at deriving reflection and transmission coefficients for planar stratified media. And we also looked at wave propagation anisotropic media around this time. Okay, then we did a very important chapter, six. We looked at uh, how to calculate E and H given a J or an M right, using the concepts of vector potentials, magnetic vector potential, electric vector potential, and so forth, right? And we, we studied the simplification to, of these equations for far field observations, right? And how we related the uh, current distribution or the far field pattern to the Fourier transform of the current distribution or the aperture field, right? So these are, these are really good concepts. Uh, Basically, we solved the wave equation, but the inhomogeneous wave equation with the right-hand side not equal to zero, some source distribution. We invoked the concepts of Green's functions, right, and spatial convolutions against those Green's functions as kernels with the input function being the current density. And then we looked at theorems and principles. We can't solve any problems in electromagnetics that are more complicated than canonical geometries without understanding these theorems and principles, right? These were very important. Here where we saw physical optics, we saw reciprocity reaction, equivalence theorems are super useful. Make sure you understand equivalence theorems, uniqueness, duality, and so forth, right? We skipped eight and nine and 10, wave guiding. We did a lot of uh, scattering, then we went into scattering. So we did plane wave scattering off of planar structures, cylindrical structures, spherical structures, and we did all of that, right? Line sources, we looked at how to expand or mode matching. Expand the incident field and the scattered field in terms of the same set of cylindrical modes, spherical modes, and use boundary conditions in order to match those modes and derive expressions for the unknown coefficients in the expansions. All right? And we ended the semester there. We looked a little bit at metamaterials and metasurface modeling at the end as a bonus. So that brings us to this course. We're doing eight. We're doing all the waveguides. Rectangular cross-section, circular cross-section, and spherical transmission lines and cavities right? As the first three things we're going to study. Then the book gets into 
integral equation of moment method. This is my favorite thing. This is what we use a lot in, in my research and will be a super useful thing for you guys to learn. All right, and I'm, I'm excited to teach it to you. Integral equations, then we get into GTD, geometrical theory of diffraction, which is also super useful. My PhD thesis was based on both these algorithms. As a matter of fact, two chapters or two halves of my thesis, one on moment method and the other on GTD, but for particular applications. We'll learn all that. And then we're going to learn Green's functions. Green's functions are important. And I think we have some extra topics sprinkled at the end, metamaterials, metasurfaces, things that I can uh, bring into the course if we have time. So also in the middle of that, we're going to learn differential geometry. So all of this, all of these topics, we're going to learn how to represent arbitrary curves in terms of parameterizations and calculate their tangent vectors, the normal set up a, a right-handed uh, coordinate system that, that travels along the, uh, our parameterized curve, how to represent surfaces, the concept of curvature matrices, the concept of principal curvatures, tangent planes, and um, how to approximate surfaces using Taylor series expansions. And, and so forth, right? That's a very important step. We have to have this mathematical background in order to solve or to study geometrical theory of diffraction, right? And then um, these algorithms are very, very useful for, you know, lens design, reflector design, or, or um, they're the, at least the ray tracing approaches. The uh, method of moments is used for everything, right? That, that's the power. That's uh, everything you need. So I'm excited for that. And Green's functions, all right? There's a calendar that has everything we're going to do in the course in it. Any, any day that we're not going to have class is going to be uh, indicated in the calendar. So classes began today. Here's lecture one. We have a couple of lectures. We have some homeworks here. They're tentative dates, but when they might be due. And I'll, I'll let you know when the homeworks are assigned and when they're due. And then we have February and there's spring break. This week here, one class will be canceled and the other will be recorded for you to watch. I want to travel that week. Um, but other than that, and we have our midterm here, right? The 13th. All right. And everything else, we have lectures up until the day of the final. All right. Which is in May. Okay. Any questions on syllabus of the course? All right. We've had a lot of you, right? There's some new faces, though. Very good. All right. Uh, where's... There's PowerPoint here. Okay, good. Uh, why is it doing that? All right. All right, so if there are no questions, let's go ahead and get into the lecture number one. All right, these lectures will be numbered lecture one, but they will be a chapter long, right? So you'll get updates to this particular handout. Um, oh, maybe we should show real quick the canvas for the course. How do I close this? Okay, the canvas of the course has, everything will be in these files here, right? We have reading material, which will be assigned in the reading material folder. You'll have your lecture notes, which you can get from that folder number two. Homeworks will be distributed in folder number three. Exams, if, they, if you are to receive a copy, will be in folder number four. And the syllabus is in folder number zero. So everything you need for the course will be in there. All right, good. Uh, okay. Great, so let's, let's uh, move into the lecture. So we're gonna study first rectangular cross-section waveguides and cavities. I'm sure you've seen this before, but we're gonna go deep into it, right? We're going to study what's in the book and I provided other things that might be useful beyond what the book has for your uh, utilization and maybe measurements that you might set up using rectangular waveguides and, and cavities, right? So, okay, about me, uh, I got my PhD from UCLA in 2018 moved to University of Michigan, did a postdoc for about three years throughout the pandemic. And then I came here as assistant professor in 2022. I worked at a couple of companies along the way here, uh, shown at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the course is gonna have 27 lectures, one midterm, one final. This is the book. I use this old one from the eighties, but you probably have this new one. And I think there's a third edition coming out soon. And this is also a backup book or supplemental text, Foundations of Applied Electromagnetics from Kamal Sarabandi. Okay, uh, course web page and so forth, right? 
So there's some references in the process of creating these lecture slides. I pull from different books and online sources, so I try to cite them. If I don't, uh, accept my apologies and let me know. Okay, what's a rectangular waveguide, right? So we studied already when we have a source, it radiates electromagnetic waves. These waves diffract, right? They spread out in all directions. If there's no boundary conditions that the waves encounter, then they cannot be redirected, right? So if I have a source, then it's going to radiate far enough away from it a spherical wave, right? Okay, well, if I want that energy not to radiate in all different directions, and I want to direct it or guide the wave in a particular, in a, along a particular path, then I have to impose certain boundary conditions such that I can redirect the energy. For example, I use this classical, uh, you know, analogy of when I speak to you guys in broadcasting, it's going in all directions. You can all hear. But if I wanted to direct my energy to a single person, I might take a cardboard tube, like a wrapping paper tube, and speak through it. And that imposes a boundary condition, right? The wave now has to travel along the particular path that the cardboard tube provides. So, and people outside or orthogonal to the tube are not going to hear anything, right? The pressurized disturbance goes through the cardboard tube. Here, it's the same thing. We want to we want to force electromagnetic waves to travel along particular paths, right? So, for example, here we have a wave. Yeah, this is like people at the baseball stadium. Whenever, whenever you have the wave going around the crowd. In a baseball stadium, only the only displacement you have is you get up out of your chair, you stand up, and then you sit back down, right? You don't move left or right. But if you do that out of phase with the neighbor, of, with your neighbor, slightly out of phase, then the effect is a wave, right? The wave goes along around the stadium. So each of these vectors, if you fixate your eye on them, one vector in the vector field is not displacing left or right. It's oscillating up or down, right? Uh, in this case, time harmonic time harmonically, right? Uh, sinusoidally or cosinusoidally. All right, great. Well, what we want to do is we want to confine this electromagnetic wave to travel along a particular path. In this case, a path formed by a rectangular metallic tube. So here what I'm showing is the modes which you're going to derive rigorously in this lecture. But uh, this is the dominant TE10 mode. And you can see this is a wave, right? This is the same wave here. But it's shown three-dimensionally here. Uh, but here it's shown where you're only plotting the vector field, so for example, the magnetic field along a plane or the electric field in a cross section. All right. So if you focus on this, what you see is these vectors are tallest or strongest in the center of the mode, and they, they die off sinusoidally to the edges of the mode. And that's exactly what you see here. You see a strong electric field in red that decays to a uh, zero to satisfy the boundary condition of perfect electric conductor having tangential E going to zero. Uh, and what happens is you get this sort of wave, right? This is a wave that's just traveling down the waveguide in, in this particular form or shape called a mode. We're going to study these, right? So we've studied last semester unguided wave propagation and scattering in the previous course. Here we turn our attention to guided wave phenomena, at least in the beginning of the course. We're going to get into uh, more of the numerical methods and look at scattering again. In order to channel an electromagnetic wave along a specified path throughout space, rather than spreading it in all directions, a metallic conduit can be used. The metallic wall boundary condition, tangential E goes to zero, confines the wave and forces it along a specified path. In guided wave phenomena, so there are a couple of different things we need to know about a guided wave or a transmission line which is used to guide a wave in order to characterize it completely, right? We would like to know the shape of the modes. So we need to know the field distribution in there, right? The electric and magnetic field, what it looks like, how to describe it analytically in terms of some functions, uh, what the electric and magnetic field look like. Uh, the other thing is we need to know uh, the wave number along the waveguide and the wave impedance. So these are things we're going to learn in, in, this, um, in this lecture here. OK, so we need to know the guided mode wave number, the modal wave impedance, and so forth. And it is also important to know the mode field profile. We're going to learn all of that. We're going to learn what dispersion means. Dispersion is extremely important, right? Free space is not dispersive. So that's why when we do scattering problems, we don't study dispersion rigorously, right? But when we get to guided wave phenomena, waveguides can be dispersive. Different structures that are utilized to, to uh, carry electromagnetic waves or energy from one point to another or a transmission line can be dispersive. So we need to understand what dispersion is. We need to characterize the dispersion so that we can understand if we design transmission lines or, and so forth or waveguides to carry energy from one point to another, we know how they 
how these different modes or that, that transportation phenomena uh, varies with frequency. Okay, so let's study with the, let's start with the rectangular waveguide. We can break the mode sets that are satisfied by the wave equation and, uh, and satisfy the boundary condition uh, if the rectangular waveguide in terms of two kinds of sets, TE to Z and TM to Z. So what does TE mean? Do you guys remember? What is TE? Very good, transverse electric, right? What does the superscript imply? Very good, so it's transverse electric to the Z direction, which means the electric field is transverse to Z, which means it has no Z component. Since Z is the direction of propagation, that means that the electric field has no Z component in the direction of travel. All right, that's one set. You have a question? Um, I always get confused by the direction of the electric field. Okay, yeah, we'll study that, or we'll, we'll clarify that. So what do we have here? Let's describe the geometry. We have X, Y, and Z, the cross-section of the waveguides in the X, Y plane. The direction of propagation is in the Z direction, right? So we see discontinuities in which direction, X and Y. We see boundary conditions we need to apply in those directions. In the Z direction, it's infinite and hollow, no discontinuity. So we already expect, just by saying that, that we'll see sine, cosine functions in X and Y and exponentials in the Z direction, right? Okay, the waveguide is rectangular. It has A along the x-axis and B along the y-axis. We know if we're looking for TE to Z modes, then we want to use an electric vector potential that has a Z component only and no magnetic vector potential. You guys remember that from last semester, right? Why is that? If we define F, how do we get E? You remember? Say again. The curl of F, okay, good. Very, very good. So, oh man. So D is equal to negative curl of F, right? And I think you can also say E is minus one over epsilon curl of F, right? Okay, so what does that mean? That means if you take the curl of some vector field, do you end up with a component in the direction of uh, in, the, in the direction orthogonal to the plane you're taking the curl in, right? Uh, what I'm trying to say is the curl is orthogonal in this case. The curl will, give, will be orthogonal to Z, right? Think about it like this. If I have a current density that's infinite and uniform in the vertical direction like this, right? We know by Ampere's law, which is the curl of H equal to J, that if I put my thumb in the direction of J, then my fingers rotate in the direction of the curl of H, right? So that means that the H field is orthogonal to the, the circulating orthogonally to the axis of which it's circulating about, which is the direction the current is. So we can kind of say that the curl vector, the curl is orthogonal to Z, right? That's the point. That's why you get TE to Z here. I only have a Z component. If I take the curl of this only Z component, then you will only get a uh, X and Y component out of that or TE to Z mode. I think I have that somewhere. Let me just show you. Well, we'll see that. I'm pretty sure. Because we have to derive it using... We'll, we'll see that. Once we plug this... Once we take the curl of F, right? All right, so to generate TE to Z modes, we choose the following vector potential, FZ. That'll give us TE to Z for sure. And no A, because we're looking for TE. When we come back and find TM modes next, we'll use AZ and F equal to zero. So this FZ, this vector potential, satisfies the homogeneous wave equation, del squared of FZ plus beta squared FZ is equal to zero. And we can apply a separable solution to this, to solve that homogeneous wave equation, we could, we could use separation of variables, right? So F is equal to FGH. And the wave equation then, by solving by this wave equation by separation of variables, we end up with uh, the rectangular wave function solutions, right? We did this last semester. Since the waveguide is bounded in X and Y, we expect cosine and sine in the X direction and cosine and sine in the Y direction. And in the Z direction, we expect traveling waves. All right? So these have unknown coefficients, C1 and D1. They have wave numbers in the X direction, beta X. And in the Y direction, we have beta Y. And in the Z direction, beta Z, of course. All three of these wave numbers have to satisfy the separation relation or the uh, constraint equation. Beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is beta squared. This is a very important equation to understand, right? 
We can't solve problems unless we understand how that relates to uh, how that constrains the wave numbers. Okay, let's assume that we only have a forward traveling wave. Then that means B3 is equal to zero. Means, so remember which one is forward traveling? Obviously, I just said it, right? But minus J beta Z goes along the Z axis. Plus J beta Z goes along the negative Z axis. So we want forward traveling waves only. We say B3 is equal to zero. That removes this solution. And then we have for the following expansion of F, right? We said F is equal to this separable product. And therefore we can, it has a Z hat here. We can say that F of X is the full F of X. Then we have H, G of Y. And then we have H of Z here for only forward traveling waves, right? Okay, good. To find the coefficients, we apply the boundary conditions to these fields. To obtain the fields, we utilize the definition of the field in terms of the vector potentials, right? So these formulas we derived last semester, how to find E and H given F, right? And these come directly from uh, utilizing the vector potential to solve the wave equation, right? So this TE implying F only and TM meaning A only. Mm. Uh, where is the intuition in that, or is it just arbitrary? So if we have, if we were deriving TE to Z sure. modes, right, transverse electric to Z, then we want to find solutions that have no Z component of E, right? So if we set F, the vector electric vector potential, to be in the direction of Z, and we take the curl of that F to find E, then we will be guaranteed that we have no Z component E because the curl is orthogonal to the direction of which you are taking the curl with respect to. Okay, let me, that was a bunch of words probably that, if I have an axis and I wanna find the rotation of a vector field around that axis, then that rotation will not have a component direction of the axis. Now, if I take, if I take my electric vector potential, point it in Z and use that as the axis and find my electric field which rotates around that axis, then I will not have an EZ component, yeah? Okay, and the curl operation is doing exactly that. Okay, so we have F, we have an expression for F on the last slide, we can find E and H directly. So EX, we find by differentiating F with respect to Y and that expression is shown here, right? Why we had before we had uh, cosine beta y and sine beta y. If we differentiate that, we end up with minus sine here and cosine here, right? And then ey, we differentiate with respect to x. We differentiate these two instead. We know there's no z component, right? H, we can get similarly from, from the expressions which govern h given f, all right? So now we have the fields, the electric and magnetic fields due to all we've assumed here so far is that we have an electric vector potential with a Z component only. And we've applied the boundary conditions, uh, or we haven't applied boundary conditions yet. We've found the fields due to an a vector, electric vector potential which has only an F com or Z component. All right, now we apply the boundary conditions to the fields, right? We need total fields. In this case, we, we have the expressions for the total fields. The boundary condition for the bottom and top walls are the electric field tangential to these walls needs to go to zero. The bottom and the top walls have tangential components E and e, X and Z, right? For the bottom, okay, so let's go back here. This wall and this wall will have only X and Z, which are tangential to it. The Y component is normal, all right? So the bottom and top walls, we use this boundary condition here, E, X for x going from 0 to a at y equals to 0 for all z is equal to e x for x going from 0 to a y equal to b. This is the bottom wall. This is the top wall for all z is equal to 0. Same thing with the z components, right? The left and right walls are different. Now x is normal. So at x equal to 0 and x equal to a for all for y going from 0 to b and all of z and, and so forth. Similarly for the x and z components. Uh, there must be a, ty a typo here, right? There is. So... This is the Y here. Make sure you make that change. The Y and the Z components are tangential to the left and right walls. Okay, so we need EZ to be zero. So we use the first two sets. We go back to, uh, since EZ is equal to zero, 
All right, yeah, so EZ is already equal to zero, right? So this we've automatically satisfied, that we've automatically satisfied. So let's go back to this one. EX at Y equals to zero uh, has to be equal to zero, right? So what do we do? We take EX, we plug in Y equal to zero in order to, to satisfy this boundary condition. And in doing so, we've replaced Y equal to zero here and here, and we set that equal to zero. Now, the only way we can satisfy this equation with the knobs that we can turn is uh, if, so sine of zero is already zero, right? But cosine of zero is one, so that means this D2 has to equal to zero. So that's our first conclusion, right? You've probably done this a hundred times, but we're just gonna walk through everything formally. All right, EX at Y equal to B now, so let's satisfy uh, this one, EX at Y equals to B, which is the uh, top wall. We plug in B here, right? So now we plug in B here, knowing that D2 is zero, so that term is gone. Now, in order for this to equal to zero, we have, we have this knob to, to, to turn, right? Beta Y. So beta Y, so what are we saying here? Sine of beta Y B has to equal to zero. Well, that means that beta Y B equals to the inverse sine of zero, which is M times pi. Therefore, beta y has to equal to m pi divided by b, yeah, for all integers. And this is how we get various discrete sets of field configurations that satisfy the boundary conditions in this problem, right? The boundary value problem, we have a discrete set of wave numbers indexed by integer n, at least at this stage, that allow us to, that each satisfy the wave equation and the boundary conditions on the rectangular waveguide. And if we've done both of those things, then we have our solution. All right, great. So for the y component, we're going to satisfy this boundary condition now. x equal to 0. We plug in x equal to 0 here and here. Sine of 0 goes to 0. d1 must be 0. All right? All right. Now x equal to a. We plug in a here. Oh, sorry. We plug in a here. We do the same thing. We find beta x has to be m pi over a. So there are two indices, m and n, that define different solutions to the wave equation and these boundary conditions, right? So for various combinations of M and N, we'll get different modes, different solutions to the wave equation. And uh, we'll then know their wave numbers too, right? Because we have beta X and beta Y, and we know only two of the three are independent because we know beta, right? So let me clarify, beta X squared, beta Z squared half to equal to beta squared, which is omega squared mu epsilon, right? We know what omega is because we set the source excitation frequency. We know what mu and epsilon are inside of the waveguide. We know what beta x and beta y are now. That means beta z has to be a function of these quantities, right? So we have, we have everything, right? Because beta z then is equal to beta squared minus beta x squared and we'll see this on the coming slides, but here's beta y and here's beta x, right? And we know beta because we have these parameters. Good. And beta z defines the wave number in the direction of propagation, right? We're going to see that beta z is dispersive. Okay, good. So let's put everything back into f now. It's in the z direction. We have the separable solution that collapses using all of these, all of these conclusions to some unknown coefficient amn that depends on the source, right? Cosine of beta x, x, cosine of beta y, y, and e to the minus j beta z. We know what beta x and beta y are. We can plug them in. We get this solution for t, e to z modes. All right? Good. So we can analyze. We're going to analyze these more in the coming slide. We'll plot a bunch of pictures of different modes. So in summary, the t, e modes, now that we have this f, right, this f, now that we have f, we can go back to these expressions and we can calculate what the electric field modes are now that we know we've applied boundary conditions. At this point, we didn't apply boundary conditions, right? We just calculated what E comes from F with a Z component only. Then we applied boundary conditions to find all of our unknowns, our wave numbers and our unknown coefficients. And we ended up with this F. We plug those, that F back in and we can get E and H. Now these are the actual E and H's. All right. So we can define a cutoff wave number, which is common practice. As, uh, as beta when beta z goes to zero. So what does cutoff mean, right? 
Cutoff means that the mode no longer propagates. It's the boundary between a propagating mode and an evanescent mode. All right, at that wave number, beta, beta z goes to zero, right? Beta z is the wave number in the direction of propagation. If it goes to zero, then propagation ceases. So beta c squared, or beta cutoff squared, which we know what beta is, it's two pi over lambda, but there's a lambda c, meaning that this is the cutoff wavelength, is equal to beta minus beta z, right? Uh, is equal to beta x squared plus beta y squared. All right, and we know what beta x is and beta y is. So beta z, beta z is equal to zero in this case, right? So look here. Let's let's look at it like this, from here. The, this equality, we have beta x squared, beta y squared, beta z squared is equal to beta squared, right? We want to know what beta gives you uh, zero beta z. So we say. Uh, beta minus beta z, which is this expression that we have here. Beta minus beta z is then beta x squared plus beta y squared. And we can find the beta cutoff, right? Beta cutoff as beta when beta z is equal to zero, all right? Beta is omega squared of mu epsilon. And we can call this omega cutoff squared of mu epsilon because the uh, omega of which beta z goes to zero, we call omega cutoff, all right? Two pi fc is omega, and then that's equal to this expression here. So this is the cutoff wave number, right? Basically, what we're trying to say is, what beta when beta z is equal to zero? Well, if beta z is equal to zero, then beta is equal to beta x squared plus beta y squared. But that's just not saying beta z is equal to zero. It's saying that the propagation has ceased, right? Beta z is zero. There's no, no propagation down the waveguide. And this is beta x squared plus beta y squared. Take the square root of both sides of this, then you get this expression, right? In your epsilon, we're assuming just free space. What's ever inside the waveguide? Could be free space, could be dielectric loaded. It'll be whatever medium is inside of the waveguide, right? Good. Okay. From this equality here, you can write this expression for the cutoff frequencies of the different modes. All right. All right. So I made a plot of these. What do we have here? We have an air filled WR90 waveguide. I think this is an X band waveguide with these parameters or these dimensions A equal to 0.9 inches, B equal to 0.4 inches. All right. So this tells us a lot about how this waveguide operates. So, first off, what I'm doing is I'm plotting omega versus beta. What plot is that? You guys have heard of this omega versus beta, right? What do we normally call that? Dispersion. dispersion. Very good. This is dispersion of a waveguide. All right? What, what is this telling me? If I operate at uh, this frequency, what happens for this waveguide? What do we have? Nothing, right? The, mode ha the first mode hasn't even appeared yet. We're below the cutoff frequency of the first mode, right? Does that mean that there's not enough energy for the wave to even propagate? It means that the beta that we're supplying, omega squared of mu epsilon, there's not enough beta to provide to satisfy the boundary conditions for the dominant mode, the lowest order mode in the in the cross section, and have beta beta z enough beta left over to give propagation in the z direction. Beta x and beta y squared have to be there to, to satisfy the boundary conditions, right? It's evanescent in the z direction, exactly. Another way to look at it is this, right? Here's, uh, remember, beta z is equal to the square root, technically there's a plus minus here, of beta x, or sorry, uh, uh, like that, yeah? So uh, beta squared minus beta x squared minus beta y squared, right? Okay, now, plus or minus the square root of beta, okay, so omega squared mu epsilon minus uh, n pi by a squared, I think this is m, plus n pi by b squared, right? So if I have a certain frequency, this frequency, 
right? Omega equal to this frequency and air inside, then this number's fixed, yeah? Now, for the lowest order mode, which is one, zero, we'll see that, then m pi over a with this a is already larger than this. So this becomes imaginary and it's an evanescent mode, right? We have to increase the frequency here until we've satisfied the conditions for the dominant modes, betas in the x and y direction, and have enough beta left over to supply beta z with a real result that allows us to have a propagating mode. Yeah? Okay, so at this frequency, we have nothing happening yet because this number is already larger than this, right? All right, so we have to increase. We have to, so, okay, so what does that mean for a waveguide? What kind of filter is it? It's a high pass filter, yeah? It passes higher frequencies, lower frequencies are blocked, right? You can think of it like that. Okay, good. So, as I increase the frequency knob on my signal generator, then nothing's happening, nothing's happening. I get to this point, and all of a sudden the first mode appears, and energy starts going down the waveguide. The first mode is, is this dominant mode that we see. So, we increase the frequency, we increase the frequency, and all of a sudden, this mode springs into existence, and it's traveling down the waveguide, right? All right, starts to carry energy. Good. Now, I keep increasing the frequency of my source until I get to the next mode that happens. We can calculate what frequency that is by knowing the indices of the next higher order mode. So this is the TE01 mode. The next mode is the is this red dash line, TE20, yeah? So if I keep increasing the frequency, now my energy is dispersed or split or distributed through uh, into two different modes. Now there are two different modes traveling down the waveguide carrying my energy, right? Why is that a problem? Normally we want to operate single mode, right? So this frequency range gives me only a single mode, the dominant mode, TE01, uh, TE10. Sorry, TE10 for this particular waveguide. All right? I want to operate here because I avoid what's called, I avoid the dispersion of the waveguide, right? Okay, so the phase velocity of these two modes are what, right? The phase velocity of this mode, let's say we operate, let's say we operate here, right? At this frequency. The phase velocity is what? Phase velocity is omega over beta, right? So we already know what omega is. It's this, right? Say this is uh, uh, 0 0.8 or something, right? Radians per second. Times 10 to the 11th, of course. Um, beta here for this particular mode is 160, for example, right? 0 0.8 divided by 160, whatever, right? Now, for the other mode, because of the dispersion of this waveguide, the other mode has this beta, right? So what that means is my two waveguide modes that are carrying my energy are traveling at different velocities, and they're going to fall out of sync. And then my, say, a square rectangular pulse that I'm trying to send down the waveguide is going to end up uh, with rounded corners and all smeared out, yeah? So you typically want single mode operation in, in these kinds of waveguides. All right, good. So uh, what is the length line? Yeah, yeah. So it's good that you mentioned that vocabulary. It's very similar to a space time diagram, right? In relativity, you have a light cone. Yeah. This is, or, or like a past and future cone or whatever. This, um, this is the light line, meaning this is the dispersion, straight line dispersion of free space, right? So free space is non dispersive, means as I increase the frequency, I linearly increase beta, right? So uh, things for waveguides that you're going to study soon, things that are outside of the waveguide, outside of the line cone, outside of the light line or outside, outside of the light cone are slow waves. They're bound to the interface, surface waves. They cannot leak. They don't couple to free space or the far field. Things that are in the light cone, inside of the light cone are fast waves and they radiate, right? So we'll see a lot of uh, ways to utilize that kind of terminology and how to read these dispersion diagrams, yeah? Okay, good. One more thing. Group velocity, right? Or energy velocity. In this book, he calls it energy velocity. 
is the derivative of okay so beta z i suppose the derivative of the dispersion curves right so what do we notice about and, and this is the energy this is the velocity of energy this is the velocity of information or modulation that we send down the waveguide right so what do we notice at these frequencies where these modes just start to appear what do we say the group velocity is there zero right there's the zero tangent here so right before the mode appears it has zero group velocity makes sense yeah because beta is equal to zero and uh at this point this cutoff wave number we have no mode appear so there's no energy traveling right each mode when it comes into existence has a group velocity equal to zero as you increase the frequency higher and higher that mode approaches the light line right good Okay, good. So these are all the different modes that appear as you increase the frequency. The higher you increase the frequency, the more modes appear in the waveguide. All right? Very nice. Let's look at TM modes now. For TM modes, we want A with the Z component only and F equal to zero. Then how do we calculate, what do we relate to A? Which field is related to A? What is it? Very good. B is the curl of A. So if A only has a Z component, then and B is the axis of which that A is rotate or B rotates around that axis, right? Hold on. Curl of A. Yeah. A has a Z component, B rotates around A, right? Around the Z component of A. So it will have no components in the direction of Z. Good. All right, and no F. So here's A with only a Z component, F equal to zero, satisfies the homogeneous wave equation for A. If we, uh, if we use the separation of variable solution, we end up with this solution, A equal to B, M, N. Now we have a different coefficient, B, sine of beta XX, sine of beta YY, and E to the minus J beta Z, right? And by applying the boundary conditions and finding the fields again, we find that... Uh, we have beta X and beta Y, which are the exact same, right? Then we can find E and H directly from our solution for A here. And we find that there's no HZ. We expect that, right, by construction. So these are modes that have no H in the, Z, in the direction of propagation. All right. Let's look at the mode impedance, right? Very important to know the modal impedance is if you're trying to match a source to excite a particular mode. Right? Then you, or if you have some kind of discontinuity and you want to calculate the effects of that discontinuity on a particular mode, then you, know the, you need to know the impedance of that mode. Right? So each mode has an impedance defined by the wave impedance. Right? Wave impedance is E over H, orthogonal to the direction of propagation. Here we're looking at the wave impedance in the plus Z direction for a TEMN mode, T E to Z. Right? We know that the direction of propagation is Z, and we want to ratio the transverse components to the direction of propagation. So that should be EX divided by HY, because X cross Y gives you Z, right? This is different than the eta. No, this is related, right? Eta is the intrinsic impedance of the medium. In, in free space or unbounded media, the wave impedance is the intrinsic impedance of the medium, right? So they're related in certain cases. In this case, they aren't. Right? They are, but there's an additional factor. We'll see. EX over HY, wave impedance. All right. Also, negative EY over HX, if we're thinking about the mode which is going in the opposite direction. And we have that's omega mu over beta Z. All right. Omega mu over beta Z. Well, beta Z is related to beta through this expression here, which I omitted the derivation now that, now that I'm looking at it, we should probably have included it, but it's in your book, right? How to relate uh, beta to beta Z, which we know what beta Z is, right? Beta Z is beta minus beta X squared minus beta Y squared. And you can relate these cutoff frequencies. So you can write this, so beta squared minus two pi, or not two pi, yeah. n pi 
m pi over a n pi over b right uh you can relate these to the cutoff frequency right a ratio of the cutoff frequency to f by going back and looking here we have this cutoff frequency has these quantities in it so you can make that relation right you can write you can write these quantities in terms of you can write it like this right okay all right so we can see here that it is related to eta but it's divided by the square root of one minus fc over f squared right and that's owing to the dispersion that's for f greater than the cutoff frequency the wave impedance for f at the cutoff frequency is infinite and why is it infinite very good right beta z is equal to zero we're dividing by it all right then we have f less than cutoff then this is a this wave impedance is imaginary which means that it doesn't it's not associated with real power flow yeah you could probably you could probably uh derive a circuit model for that and it might have might have that circuit analogy interpretation yeah very good all right, so TM modes have a similar impedance. So let's look at this. So this is a function of FC over F, right, in both cases. And we have different regions. Here is FC equal to F, F equal to F cutoff at 1, right? What do we see there? We see that uh, this one goes to infinity, the TE. So the TE is this solid line, goes to infinity, right? And the TM goes to 0. So it goes to 0. Very good. And we also see that these are going to have sort of a square root type of relationship, especially the TM has this square root function, right? Which we know looks something like that. Very nice. And we can see that. Well, okay, so why are we calling these modes? They, they have resistance above the cutoff frequency, right? E over H should have units of ohms, right? Should have all units of resistance. Should be E over H in free space is what? Very good. Three set, yeah, three seventy six, seven six, or three seventy seven, right? One twenty pi. So, E over H is a real number, a resistance. So when it has a resistance like this, then uh, that just implies the ratio of E over H is not associated with loss, right? It's the wave impedance here. A resistance means that it's a traveling mode. When it's reactive here, that means that it is an evanescent mode. Great. Sorry. All right. Can you just can you just clarify? um we're using omega in the expressions up there but we're also using f for frequency uh relative to the cutoff frequency can you just sort of clarify why we have both those terms they're not the same uh you're talking about this omega here oh omega here yeah, yeah, yeah omega yeah, yeah. mu okay yeah sure so beta omega mu over beta uh so beta z we can write as this expression right from from using those expressions before Omega here is part of the numerator. So we introduce F. We could probably write the numerator as 2 pi F as well. That's the operating omega, right? So, but the reason why we leave it as omega mu over beta is because we know that uh, that's equal to eta, right? So go, does, that, does that answer your question? Y yes, that answers my question. Thanks. Okay, great. yeah yeah that that is it's uh the plot is correct right just taking that into consideration um so one thing so wh what is this plot useful for let's say we have the dominant mode and we want to put a probe into a waveguide and we want to match the 50 ohm coax to the mode and excite it and not have a bunch of reflection and get a good s11 for example of course the input impedance to that is more than just the mode definition you, you see the back wall and so forth right uh but you would use this plot to find maybe the impedance of that mode that you're trying to match to, right? So it's a useful plot. All right. What do the mode fields look like? So here's a plot of a bunch of different mode fields. We already saw this. This is TE10 mode. This mode is the dominant mode. This is how you want to operate your waveguide because you avoid having two different modes traveling at different phase velocities that are going to disperse your data. So uh, dominant mode TE10, that's this mode. 
So this is the first one that satisfies the boundary condition, right? Beta X is equal to M pi divided by A, right? Now, uh, if M is equal to 1, then beta X is pi divided by A. And we know that beta is 2 pi over lambda, right? So from here, we can say that uh, lambda is equal to 2 pi divided by pi divided by A, right? Or we can say that that's A over 2. No, it should be A over 2, but I did something wrong. Lambda pi divided by A. Yeah, it's A over 2, right? Good. What? 2A. That's right, 2A. Sorry. All right, 2A. So this mode has, this mode in here, if you draw it like this, has a maximum here. It goes to zero here. Then it goes back to zero. Well, the wavelength that's associated with this, if we extend it, has a wavelength which is 2 times A, where this is A. Right? So you can kind of see where that beta X appears. At the higher order betas, we increase beta. The next mode is this one, TE20, right? So let's, let's understand what TE20 is. TE20 is beta X equals to M pi by A equals to 2 pi divided by A now. And that's equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. And now we can say that lambda is equal to A, right? Okay, good. So here, start at zero. Get a maximum, go back to zero. Then we go to another maximum, but you can't see it. But this vector is vertical, and this one here is, is also vertical, but it's pointing down. They're pointing in opposite directions, yeah? This one is pointing up, and this one's pointing down. So this goes to a negative maximum, and then back to zero. So this mode is associated with a transverse beta in the x direction of uh, m pi over 2 pi over a, t e 2 0, right? And there's no variation in the vertical direction because this is 0. There's nothing going on in the vertical direction. It's uniform in the vertical direction, right? All right. What about t e 0, 1? That's just the opposite of t e 1, 0, or rotation, right? y becomes the, the direction of which we're uniform. What about TE11 now? So, okay, this one's kind of interesting. What's that? Yeah. Here's 3, 0. That's easy to see, right? So this one's pointing up, then down, then up. All right. And, and so forth, right? We can have combinations of 2 in the x direction, 1 in the y direction, and so forth. Yes. Is TE01 not also considered a dominant mode? And if not, why? TE01 happens after TE10. That's why. Let's go back. Changing in omega? Yeah, the frequency. So the green one's first, right? That's TE10. The next one is this red dash one is TE20. And the reason why is, okay, so when do we see TE01, which is the red one? After that, right here. It's right here. So the order is TE10, then TE two zero then t e uh zero one and the reason why is because of the rectangular nature of the waveguide right you get more beta out of the broader wall or, or sorry the narrower wall because it's two pi divided by a or m pi divided by a or m pi divided by b if there was a square waveguide then they would happen at the same time right yeah so the shorter wall does have higher frequency because Across the shorter wall, uh, you have to go to zero on both sides, right? So that's going to happen over a faster or shorter distance. So the wavelength will have a short, it'll be a shorter wavelength, which is associated with a higher frequency, right? All right, very good. Okay, let's see where we're at here. Yeah, so these are the modal field patterns. We can kind of get a feel for them based on the uh, solution. Yes. The direction of the vectors? Yeah. Like in the with the red part, like can you tell which is up and which is down or you just have to No, so this one so this one here has I can see it, right? It's wow. vertical. These are pointing up, this one's pointing up. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. okay. But that's that's kind of arbitrary, right? Because each, this is a cross sectional view of the waveguide, right? Each of the vectors in this cross sectional vector field 
or the cross-section of a vector field is another vector field in a plane. Each of those vectors are going to, uh, are going to oscillate e to the j omega t. So they'll, both, they'll start to oscillate at different times, then this one will point down, this one will point up, right? Each of these vectors are like a, a person at a baseball stadium, and they're going to oscillate up and down in time. Furthermore, this cross-section, it's okay, so look at this cross-section, right? It's hard to understand how this cross-section gives you this mode, right? It applies to this entire mode. How does that happen? Because each of these vectors in here, let me be clear, this, this is the cross-section of this mode, right? Each of the vectors, this vector, for example, in this modal distribution plot is going to be multiplied by e to the minus j beta z z, right? e to the minus j beta z is an oscillating function of z. So at some z, let's say z equals to zero, maybe we get this exact plot. If I were to pause this, I wonder if I could do that. Imagine I could pause it, then I'd have a vector like that, right? As this vector in this cross-sectional view. At some later z, I have to multiply this vector by e to the minus j beta z, which is taking this entire modal pattern and multiplying every vector by it by e to the minus j beta z, and I can shift this pattern to different planes, right? Different planes in z. e to the minus j beta z is an oscillating function. So at some point, this will go to zero, and at some point, it'll go to negative maximum and a positive maximum. So this vector here doesn't, it all oscillates in time in its place right here, and it oscillates with respect to z in terms of e to the minus j beta z. If you combine both those concepts, you get this animation. How is the animation from t equals 0 different from t equals Very good. So you see this, you see how there's one maximum right at that point. That's exactly this picture, right? If I multiply that exact point by e to the minus j beta z, then I get all these other cross sections that make up this kind of modal profile. Now, you could start with this profile. You'd have two maxima here, and you would see uh, two red hot spots next to each other traveling down. Instead of one in the middle, you'd have two, and they would travel in the same bubble-looking thing, right? Like, for example, this is a crazy mode, 4-3. And you can see all of, so there are four, four variations in this direction and three in the vertical direction, and they, they travel like this is one, right? But here's the same thing before three. There's a high, high frequency to get this mode. So with free space, we have Z fraction of propagation and then E and then H is orthogonal to that. Um, but where is the H when we have a waveguide and we have an HC component? So, so remember, uh, E orthogonal to H orthogonal to the direction of propagation is for TEM modes, right? And this waveguide does not, there's no TEM mode that satisfies the boundary conditions in this waveguide, right? The T E and T M modes. And therefore, we don't have that relationship. E is always orthogonal to H, orthogonal to K, right? What we have, what always holds is Maxwell's equations. So if you have E, you can take the curl of E, divide by uh, J omega mu, and you can get H, right? That's only if we have a centric conductor, do we have? Minus J omega mu. Uh, if you have two conductors, you can, you have the possibility to support a T M mode. But there's only one conductor, right? Very nice. Okay, any other questions? So are these, these are sort of intuitive, right? These are, this is solution to Maxwell's equations with these boundary conditions, right? That's all this is. The solution of the wave equation, which is derived from Maxwell's equations for the boundary conditions of which form a rectangular pipe. You get these solutions. Very nice. Yes? Um, you mentioned earlier about how these higher order modes are not desirable because you end up with multiple modes propagating at different speeds. Yes. Um, so... I guess, like in these higher, so like say TE four zero for example, are those different? Are those different sections propagating at different speeds, or like I'm kind of confused on how that works? So this mode will still be there with this profile, but superimposed to that. Remember, vector field superimposed, electric field superimposed. I take this four zero pattern, and or this one for example, and for at every point, every x, y, and z, I add the vectors associated with this mode and that mode. I'll get some jumbled mess in here, right? It won't be nice uh, delineated into these two modes. It'll be the superposition of those two. But those two are going to travel at different velocities. So there's going to be a lot of beating going on in different uh, dynamics 
if you were to plot the animation of both those modes. If you put at the beginning of the waveguide your information, say equally, which is probably not the case, but equally into these two modes, by the time you pick out that information at the end, the energy you put into the faster mode you'll pick out first, and it'll become decorrelated or desynchronized with the information in the other mode. If you're able to, these modes are orthogonal, so you might be able to put uh, information, different information in the two modes, and then you could have higher data uh, capacity, right? So, so for, for first, for the applications, uh -huh. you always want to work with one mode because no matter what, when you go high in frequency, you're going to get, gonna get more modes. Okay. Yes, okay. But we'll get to the, how to excite particular modes. There, there may be the possibility that you excite one mode without, uh, without ex we have to excite the modes, right? If you operate at a particular frequency, all of them are possibly, all of them are eigenmodes, right? But if you don't excite certain ones, then they may not be, they, might, they may not carry energy. That's the geometry of the structure? The feed. We'll see. We'll see. Depending on... If I want it, we'll see, we're going to derive an equation that really explains the physics of how you couple to these modes. If I put a wire here, like a coax coming from here, right? I have some kind of coaxial cable with a center conductor, and the center conductor goes right there. From the cross-sectional view, it'll look like that, a wire. If I put that wire where the maximum of the mode is, then I strongly couple to it, and I'm near the frequency of that mode, all right? But if I move the wire, say I put the wire over here, close to the sidewall, right? Let me delete everything here. Sidewall, right? Close to the sidewall, not on the sidewall. This mode will be weakly excited, weakly couples to this wire, right? I'll probably excite this mode more. So, and then if I'm close to the resonant frequency of this mode and operating frequency, then uh, this one will be even strongly excited and this one even weaker. So you might be able to control which mode you use, right? By coupling to them differently. What time does this end? 5.15? Okay. All right, so let's look at the dominant mode. That's the, the one that uh, we're going to study the most. That's the one that's typically used in order, if you want to, uh, if you connect these up to like a spectrum analyzer and you want to calculate reflection and transmission through some kind of sample, a metamaterial or something, or a dielectric, and you want to characterize equivalent material parameters for that uh, by calculating scattering parameters from it, you might use the dominant mode in a rectangular waveguide like this. All right, so we can investigate dominant mode m equal to one, n equal to zero. The electric vector potential for the dominant mode with m equal to one and n equal to zero is just this expression here. And we can see that, right? This should mathematically explain this picture over here and this one. So what happens? Cosine of pi x over a. When x is equal to a, or when x is equal to zero, what do we get? Oh, sorry, this is f. We have to differentiate it, right, to get e. So I jumped the gun there. Here's beta x which is just pi over a because m is equal to 1, and beta y is equal to 0 because n is equal to 0, right? Then we differentiate. Okay, here's the cutoff wave number, which is 2 pi over lambda or pi over a. We can find the cutoff wavelength is 2 times a. That's the wavelength of your source that, start, that you start to see this mode at, right? Okay, now we find the field components. Ex is 0, Ez is 0, all we've done is plug m equal to 1 and n equal to 0 in the expressions we derived before in general. This picture here should be described by this expression, and it is, right? So when x is equal to 0, here's the x-axis. When x equals to 0, then sine of 0 is 0, the field goes to 0, right? It has to. Why? Because this is a y component of field, so it's this way, and it's tangential to a metallic wall there, right? So that has to go to 0 by the boundary conditions. All right, so we know it's zero there. When x is equal to a, when x is equal to a, these two cancel, you get sine of pi. And that's also zero because this is also ey and is tangent to a uh, uh, conductive wall. Now, when x is equal to a over two, what do we get? Well, we get sine of pi over two and that's one. All right, so it's a maximum in the center. So all the vectors in that vector field, in this vector field, are pointed in the y direction because the y component, there's no x, there's no z. And they have this spatial distribution. And each of these vectors, now that we've said, you know, there's a maximum one here, right? At, at uh, x's and y, at different x's and y's, it's not a function of y, right? So 
these are all the same in the y direction. Each of these vectors, if you can see each of these little vectors in here, we multiply by e to the minus j beta z. And as z changes, then e to the minus j beta z goes through zeros and maximum and minima, and we get this picture, right? Okay, good. And then there's h. So here's other ways to look at it. Uh, at the front of the waveguide, we have cross-section number two, which is this one, which is a cross-section in the xy plane. Then we have maxima. These are grouped very close together, indicating that it's strong, and zero over here. And the magnetic field circulates around, right? Uh, let's look at the magnetic field, because we haven't talked much about that. Here's the magnetic field, right? So the magnetic field here, if you can see it right here, circulates about the electric field vector, and it should, right? So um, it circulates, and when it has a maximum, it starts to change its direction of circulation. Uh, it's probably better to see a plot like that, but if you stare at this long enough, then you can appreciate the relationship between E and H, which is governed by Maxwell's equations, right? Okay, you can also see that from these kind of plots where they try to do their best to show you these modes without animations and computer graphics. But uh, see here. The magnetic field, so this is cross-section one. Cross-section one is an XZ cut, right? It's this one. And there you're looking down on top of the waveguide. You can see the magnetic field forms closed loops. Uh, you guys know why that happens, right? It's so, have a magnetic source. Very nice. Curl of B is always zero. So it always forms closed loops. So we're going to have these closed loops here, right? That way and this way around the maxima of the electric field, which is in and out of the board here, right? Very good, and, and so forth, right? Okay, so, all right, maybe we should stop here. But we'll look at the surface current density, and then just to give you a kind of a preview of what we're going to look at, we'll look at the surface current density and what that looks like on the walls of the waveguide. We'll look at TE10 mode decomposed into two plane waves. You can look at it in this viewpoint, which is useful for doing waveguide similar measurements of infinite periodic structures. We'll talk about that a little bit. Look at the power density, the attenuation, and uh, then we'll get into how to expand fields in terms of modes by solving the wave equation in terms of eigenfunction expansions and how to couple to these modes. That's when we'll start looking at how to excite different specific modes. All right. All right, good, guys. I will see you uh, next Monday, all right? Email me if you have any questions on, on how the course is going to go. And if you need any background study material, email me, I can point you to the videos from the last, last semester that will help you if you need some background. Because, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into some more interesting stuff. I'm sure you've seen waveguides before, right? But this is something we have to cover. Or you get super fun stuff when we get past these chapters, all right? All right, see you guys. So you're looking forward to it, but possibly a few spots. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm really excited about that. I just, I'm just a little scared I'll get uh, I'll start falling behind. Well, I mean, I understood the most part of everything today because we covered this in microwave and RF. But once we get to crazy yeah, so, stuff, uh, right. I'm going to what's called the um, so far so good regime. Yeah, so far so good. But there are a lot of problems that you want to no, I took it in five with fall 22. Uh, um, so it's, and it was with a different professor, so he covered it's like a couple of And then, uh, actually, uh, feelings on that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Nothing I could do about it. They didn't offer 5106 last spring when I went yeah. to Why? But the RF is not enough. Okay, yeah, low enrollment. Right. Yeah, uh, when I took it in the five last semester, there was like four people. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like sometimes I don't think about it. So it's like a half hour. Yeah, so it's way different. So it's not what really so many people have. I don't know if people rudimentary to it about their professor or just their one hour. Yes. I love it. But I don't want to be in the school that had like a full class. Yeah. Yeah, all that. All that stuff. Yeah. Is it the biggest I've had since like ever 3000? Even bigger, was it bigger than your 3000 level? You want to go about the same size? Really? Our 3000, ours was like 
Probably like 60 yeah. people. Really? Yeah. Or wait, for two or for... You're, you're you're gonna gonna ask. Ask. Right, yeah, right. Oh, sorry. I was thinking of my RF, the intro to RF. Oh, yeah, no, that comes yeah, the EM class. Yeah, the EM class. That's like 16 people oh, okay. for me for intro to RF. Yeah, okay. yes, yeah, compare it to that one. The microwave and RF had like, we almost, it almost didn't run last semester. Yeah, I'm not surprised. That one was pretty small too when I took the yeah. yeah, so eta divided by the square root of one minus F over FC squared. Yeah, but for awkward blow cutoff, if you have, yeah. You, if you blow cut off, you operate close to the um, yeah. close to zero, then the peak becomes uh, real, doesn't it not? If you operate below the cutoff, no, it's reactive, right? Yeah, but it's reactive. But as you, it's like it's like one over the FC over F. Oh. F so F over FC minus one square root. So as you get closer to zero, then it becomes square root of negative one, and so that becomes J. And J cancels out. So doesn't that become real? Uh, there's no J in that expression, right? It's eta divided by the square root of one minus F over FC over F. Yeah. Now, if F is below cutoff, yeah. then that means uh, FC over F is greater than one. So yeah. you get an imaginary.